Steel versus Aluminium. The rise and fall of aluminium shafts. A comparison on the review table. Comparison at the range. Some of you might not want to watch the whole video, so here are some time checks in case you want to skip ahead. A major development in golf club design, and yet one that a lot of people have never even heard of. Come on. Let's talk about stuff, baby. Damn right. Yes, I'm talking about aluminium shafts. They appeared towards the end of the 1960s and most manufacturers adopted them in their range. But within a couple of years, they'd all but disappeared. And now, uh, if you talk about them, most people have never even heard of them. So, let's look into the, the history, the rapid rise and the equally rapid demise of the aluminium golf shaft. Golf shafts, often called the engine of a golf club. The shaft's role is crucial in delivering the club head to the ball at speed and where we want it. For many years the hickory shaft was the standard, until that is in the 1920s when steel shafts were developed to the point where they could compete in terms of weight, stiffness, torque and cost. Steel very quickly superseded hickory as the shaft of choice and for most golfers it's still the commonest material used for irons. Graphite shafts have made inroads, but steel is still king. And today we tend to think of just steel and graphite when it comes to golf shafts. But club manufacturers and shaft developers have always been on the lookout for alternatives. Aluminium was tried as one of those alternatives in the late 1950s and early 1960s. But it couldn't meet the exacting specifications required for a golf shaft. In 1954, the Californian company, Golfcraft, claimed a first when with the fiberglass shaft, which had a steel core and a fiberglass outer. However, they were prone to vibrate at impact and didn't ignite the golf world. But a few other companies dabbled with fiberglass shafts, and perhaps the best known being Shakespeare, who were well known for fiberglass fishing rods. They thought they'd solved the problems that Golfcraft had encountered by using a hollow fiberglass shaft. Shakespeare paid Gary Player to promote the shafts and introduced a Black Knight model. Player briefly represented Shakespeare's, but apparently he used steel shafts painted black to look like fiberglass shafts. And he soon distanced himself from them, as shown by this comment. Fiberglass shafts never achieved any real acceptance from golfers, and the material's greater weight and the difficulty of manufacturing to tight tolerances meant that it never caught on, and by the end of the 1960s, Shakespeare had given up on them. As an interesting aside, in 1967, Shakespeare employed South African-born Frank Thomas and employed him at the Plymouth Golf Ball Company, which was a division of Shakespeare. There, they asked him to devote his time to developing the best golf shaft possible. Thomas tried many materials and designs until he met up with the Union Carbide Company, who'd been developing graphite fibres. Thomas impregnated the graphite fibres with epoxy, wrapped them round a steel rod and covered it with a cellophane sheath. He then hung it in an oven to cure. After the epoxy had set, the cellophane and steel rod were removed and he was left with a strong shaft that weighed a little over half that of the equivalent steel shaft. And so the graphite shaft was born and was introduced in January 1970 at the PGA Merchandise Show. While Frank Thomas is generally credited with the development of the graphite shaft, I did find this interesting snippet in the October 1969 edition of Golf Monthly, discussing the work of two scientists at the National Engineering Laboratory in Scotland, who might be able to make a similar claim. But there was a shaft material that threatened to knock steel off its perch. That material was once again aluminium, but this time a higher grade aluminium alloy than had been used previously. It was introduced in the mid-1960s and towards the end of the decade aluminium shafts were heralded as the successor to steel and were expected to become the dominant material for golf shafts. In a short space of time just about every manufacturer of note was promoting their clubs with aluminium shafts. Wilson, Spalding, Golfcraft, Hillary and Bradsby, Ram, Pedersen, even Shakespeare had an aluminium shaft. But how did this rapid move to aluminium shafts come about? A major influence in the introduction and adoption of aluminium shafts was Arnold Palmer, a man who looms ever large in the rise of golf as a popular sport. But first we have to look at how aluminium went from being an unsuitable material to a potential world beater. 
And for that, there's no better place to start than La Fayelle. The La Fayelle Manufacturing Company was founded near Los Angeles in 1930. And during the Second World War, they became a manufacturer of tubes and rods for the aircraft industry and later developed a whole range of metal forming processes. Their expertise was such that they supplied many components for the rocket industry, including NASA programs. Around the 1950s, they set up La Fayelle Sports Products to use some of this expertise. In the mid-1960s, they turned to aluminium golf shafts. At roughly the same time, True Temple were doing the, the same thing. With the new high-specification alloys and improved production methods, the stage was set for aluminium to make its return. Arnold Palmer had been with Wilson since he was an amateur. But in 1963, he founded the Arnold Palmer Golf Company to manufacture golf clubs. Palmer had always liked heavy-headed clubs and was always trying to take weight out of the grip and shaft and add it to the head. So it's no surprise that he was one of the first to use the new aluminium shafts and was indeed the first to win on tour with them at the 1967 Los Angeles Open held in January of that year. This high-profile win from America's favourite golfer provided plenty of publicity for the aluminium shafts and very quickly the big manufacturers were speaking to Lafayel and True Temper. The Lafayel shaft was a tapeless shaft while the True Temper was a step-down type as per their steel shafts. Here in the UK we lagged a little behind what was happening in America but quickly began to take notice. And this article appeared in March 1968 in Golf Monthly magazine. It tells how, following a strong showing for aluminium shafts in 1967, that at the recent US PGA trade show, club professionals inspected and tested aluminium shafted clubs. American publication Golf Digest had made an exhaustive study and found that the advantages claimed for the shafts are 1. Lighter weight 2. Less prone to twisting and therefore hit the ball straighter 3. Less vibration or shock at impact and 4. A greater degree of control over swing weight. Some disadvantages were also noted, one being the cost which can add a significant amount and at this stage they were mostly being bought by senior and lady golfers in America who appreciated the lighter weight. Also in 1968 is this advert from Golf World, the first advert I've come across by a UK manufacturer advertising aluminium shafts by John Letters. And again from Golf World is this article about aluminium shafts appearing in the December 1968 edition. So a little behind that of Golf Monthly. It predicts that in 1969 every major manufacturer in the country will follow John Letters by offering aluminium shafts as an option. From Golf Monthly's January 1969 section on trade are two manufacturers introducing aluminium. Slazinger on their top of the range Jack Nicklaus clubs and Wilson. And the following month, in the same trade topics section, we note the names of J.H. Onions and George Nicol jumping on the bandwagon. In Golf Monthly's March 1969 edition, exactly a year on from their first article, Golf Monthly again review the aluminium shaft and update us on its progress in the UK. This looks at what's expected to be a significant move to aluminium for 1969 sales, especially by the American brands such as Spalding and Wilson. Most British firms will have a proportion of their models, often the leading designs, offered with aluminium shafts, and it's forecast that roughly 50% of production will be of aluminium shafted clubs. The table shown here indicates the expected sales percentage of clubs with aluminium shafts, together with those models incorporating them, where known. It also shows the additional cost per club, which is quite high when it's considered that the average iron price is around five to six pounds. A set of clubs could see the purchaser paying an additional £6.10, ten shillings, which is not insignificant. And if they went for American imported shafts, they could be on for an additional £12 or £15. Pounds. Most shafts for the UK market will be produced by the British Steel Golf Shafts Company, who hold the True Temper licence. The response from club and playing professionals is still uncertain. No tournament players have yet committed but some club professionals are very positive. Wilson are one of the most positive of the, of the American brands, with five leading models using aluminium exclusively, while J.H. Onions, although offering aluminium, say that they've not yet seen one worthwhile reason to change from steel. 
Tyrese, however, is in full support of the shafts and believes that they will help all golfers and thinks yardage gains of around 10 yards are achievable. But the JH Onions Company take a slightly less enthusiastic view and add this valid comment. We do not question the quality of the shafts which are made by experts, but we certainly do not believe that they can safely be abused to the same extent as steel shafts. The question of the shaft's resistance to general wear and tear in the golf bag and car boot is raised in the article too. It's again mentioned that since Arnold Palmer's success in 1967, there's been no uptake in the professional ranks of aluminium shafts, and Arnold Palmer has stopped using them too. This has to have a bearing on the perception of the club golfer. The American manufacturers have been very positive about their results in the previous year and UK manufacturers are gearing up for what they expect will be a strong demand from British golfers. This review drew high praise from one reader whose letter appeared in the correspondence section of the following month's magazine, but it is from British Steel Golf Shafts. In the same April 1969 edition is a review of clubs for sale in the UK and it includes aluminium shafts where offered. We can see that John Letters and Goody offer three models, McGregor only one, Slazinger offer two, these being their top of the, top of the line men's and ladies models, and Wilson's top line models are only offered with aluminium shafts. Creighton and George Nicholl have several models available. Golf Monthly asked for readers' experiences of using aluminium shafts, and a few readers wrote in, and these were printed, and are mostly positive, as shown here. So, as golf in the UK entered the start of the 1969 season, the stage was set for a revolution in golf club sales, and most people within the industry were expecting a surge of interest from the buying public. But reading the magazine issued over the next year or so, Apart from adverts during the first six months or so, aluminium shafts are noticeable only by their absence. As we look back in hindsight, we know that the aluminium shaft revolution didn't happen. There are very few examples of aluminium shafted clubs remaining in the UK, and I don't think they're too common in America either. So what went wrong? Why didn't the aluminium shaft capture the public's imagination? I think that there are several reasons rather than one major weakness. Firstly, there is the additional cost. Nobody likes to part with their hard-earned cash unnecessarily. Secondly, we have the perceived fragility of the shaft. There are tales of shafts becoming brittle in cold weather and breaking, but aluminium doesn't become brittle at low temperatures. They may work hard and through use, but tests made at the time showed that it would require years of play to reach that point. However, after conversations with a golf club professional of the time, he advised that in his experience, many shafts either broke off at the hosel or bent at the hosel. And this was mostly the irons and not the woods, which makes me wonder if the hard edge at the top of the hosel was digging into the softer aluminium shaft and creating a weak spot at that point. Also, because the bore of the shaft was wider than steel at the top, standard thickness rubber grips were thicker on aluminium shafts than steel and consequently not suitable for uh, people with smaller hands. The regular men's flex in aluminium was slightly stiffer than a regular in steel and more so in irons than woods. Aluminium shafts will certainly scratch more easily than steel so they would mark up more quickly and look shabby. And then we have the performance claims. I think that the industry may have overpromised here. Some distance gains might be possible but not the 10 to 15 yards claimed which seems excessive. And neither do I think that the reduced torque that was championed would have made the average golfer hit their shots any straighter than they did with steel. But what I think was the final nail in the coffin for aluminium was when its reduced weight advantage was lost, as that was the key advantage claimed for the shaft and was indeed the reason given for longer shots. In the early 1970s, the steel shaft produced its counter-offensive with a lightweight steel shaft, as shown in this True Temper advert from May 1970 for their Dynalite shaft, which offered the lightweight advantage of aluminium, but with the familiar comfort of steel and without the additional cost. If we look at manufacturers' adverts from early 1971, it's clear that the aluminium shaft has been consigned to history. Where it's put most starkly is in this advert from Slazinger for the latest Jack Nicholas model. Creighton mentioned Dynalite shafts, but not aluminium. Dunlop's new Tony Jacklin model featured the Dynalite shaft, 
as to Goody's new Climax model. Green Tree have another version of a lightweight shaft in the Contralite from Japan. And John Letters, one of the first UK adopters of aluminium, jump at the Dynalite shaft in their latest Gary Player Mark III model. The only manufacturer I could find who does mention aluminium shafts was perhaps their biggest champion, Wilson. In this rather bizarre but interesting advert, and even then it's almost a footnote. There we are then. By early 1971, the fanfare for the aluminium shaft had fizzled out, and it was already consigned to Golf's deep vault of gallant failures. As I said earlier, examples of aluminium shafted clubs aren't that common now, but I found one for your entertainment, and we'll compare it with an equivalent steel shafted club on the review table. And then we'll test them at the range. Let's have a look at uh, a couple of clubs then. I've got two clubs on the table here, both by Craigton, Scottish company. Uh, one is the Craigton Royal Gold, which was one of the first models they produced. So I'm guessing that this was produced somewhere between 1966 and 1970. And the other one is the Craig Royal, uh, produced, I would guess, because of its aluminium shaft. This is the aluminium shafted club, uh, sometime around about 1968 or 1969. They're both five irons. You can see on the sole there, just look at the faces there, identical in style. Uh, so let's have a look at the shafts. One of the claims for the aluminium shaft was that it would give uh, a greater swing speed for the average golfer. A lighter shaft meant that the player could swing, uh, swing faster. Uh, I have measured these in various ways and weight wise the aluminium shafted club is actually slightly heavier than the steel shafted club and because we know that the aluminium shaft is lighter by about 20 grams or just over half an ounce it would suggest that the head in the Craig Royal must be heavier. Uh, we'll just have a quick look at the grips because that does impact the, the clubs as well. The uh, Royal Gold is one that I've re-gripped with a, a, a generic Tor Pride grip and the Craig Royal has got an original uh, looks like an original leather wrap grip so that might be slightly heavier and it might explain the difference in the weights of the two clubs. I'll be taking them both down to the range and doing a, uh, a comparison of them uh, actually hitting the two clubs but let's uh, just put this one to the side and have a look at the aluminium shaft so that's what we're, we're really interested in here. It is a stepped shaft although if I bring back the uh, the steel shaft we can see that the the steps in the steel shaft are quite distinct and they're easy to see whereas those in the aluminium shaft there's one there one there one there they're very slight um, compared to the uh, those in the steel shaft which means that the degree of taper is quite a bit less in the aluminium shaft not that that's significant in any way the walls of the aluminium shaft as has already been mentioned are quite a bit thicker than the steel shaft um, one of the claims for that was that it would be, uh, uh, give it a, a better torque, uh, so the head would be less inclined to twist. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, if we look at, at the shaft label, because this is quite interesting as well. It's a true temper uh, shaft by uh, British Steel Golf Shafts or Ackles and Pollock, who had the license to manufacture true temper products, and we can see the name aluminium rocket so it's bringing back the rocket name which was uh, a true temper shaft name from the 1950s and if we just turn it over a little bit more we can see that the flex is regular we'll just compare that with the shaft band on the royal gold that's again it's a true temper but this one is a dynamic and it's been uh, made in scotland and i think that's the I don't know that's the Creighton Golf. I think it might be the Creighton Golf logo. It looks similar to it. So there are the two clubs then. As I say, I have uh, mic'd up the, the diameters of the shaft. So I'll bring those up now um, so that people can compare them. The, uh, the taper, as I said, in the aluminium shaft is quite a bit less than the taper in the steel shaft. Swing weight in the steel one is a D0 and in the aluminium one is a C9. So 
swing speed wise I suppose that the theoretically the uh, aluminium shaft club will be able to be swung quicker than the steel shafted club even though it is a slightly heavier club it does have a lighter swing weight so one of the claims for the aluminium shaft is, is uh, holding true there okay well that sums up the uh, a very quick look at the two clubs uh, it's nice that they are from around about the same period and they are by the same manufacturer so let's take them to the range and see how they perform a few quick notes before i start i measured the lofts of the clubs and they're both 30 degrees and as we've already seen there's only three millimeter difference in the lengths so they're practically identical from a loft and length point of view i'm going to hit five full shots with each club and then compare the averages I haven't hit the aluminium shafted club yet, which was perhaps, perhaps a bit of a mistake, as I was a little cautious with it, unsure of how it would behave. Let's begin then. I'm going to hit the steel shafted club first. Shank. I should have said earlier, I tend to shank everything down the range. You won't count that one. Bit of a pull to the left. Blocking everything to the right today. Right, I'm going to go straight in with the aluminium. Haven't hit it yet. Feel wise, it does feel a bit heavier in the head. Like most of the weight is in the head. It's quite a nice feeling actually. A couple of practice swings. Right, see how we go. Definitely sounded different. There we go. Shank with that one. Let's take a look at the results then. Starting with the steel shaft, I was quite pleased with the consistency I got with these, apart from the shank of course. I wasn't trying to hit the ball as hard as I could, just a smooth swing. And now the aluminium. A bit more inconsistent with the figures here. As I said, I think this was down to me thinking about the club and not, not just concentrating on making my usual swing. And if we compare the averages, it's obvious that the steel shaft is the clear winner. Carry is almost 10 yards further, which is what the aluminium shaft was supposed to give. But I do think that this was more operator error than the fault of the club, and I'm a bit annoyed that I didn't spend a little bit of time warming up with the aluminium club. And for that reason, I think I'm going to repeat the exercise, but make sure that I'm properly warmed up. And here's a teaser for you. It will be a part of what I intend to be the next video when I test a fiberglass shaft. Watch this space. One important piece of data from the test though, the shank count for steel and aluminium was exactly the same. Before I sign off, I did mention that the aluminium shaft had more, a more wooden or hollow sound to it. I don't know if it's possible to tell from the audio that here in quick succession are the five shots with the steel shaft and then the five shots with the aluminium shaft. Well, I hope you found the video interesting and entertaining. Thanks as usual for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye.